Red Science there is going to continue uh, just on the theme of Canada, looking at some of the work that he has uh, been doing. Red is pursuing a Master of International Development Policy at Duke University. He was awarded a Rotary Peace Fellowship in 2012. And he's focusing his research on how techniques and tools designed for international peace building and development might be used to pursue reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous populations in Canada. He received a Mellon Grant to enable some of this research work that he has done last summer. And Red holds a BA in Political Studies from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, so he's very familiar with this work that he's going to be talking about, uh, which he entitles his presentation to be Pursuing Reconciliation and Mutually Beneficial Relationships Between Indigenous and Non-Indigenous Communities in the Canadian pro province of Saskatchewan. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for everyone for coming. It's an exciting uh, panel. I'm excited to be here with such an impressive um, group of people. Um, I'm quite honored and, and humbled, frankly, to be here. Um, I wanted to, I guess, build on what uh, James and I has talked about, and his, his talk really sort of fits with my theme very well in terms of uh, a reconciliation between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in my home province of Saskatchewan. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about the, con the problem that we're dealing with, which is conflict between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Uh, I'm going to try to define a little bit what positive peace and reconciliation means. Those are pretty loaded words, and, and I'm going to give you a bit of sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll try to give you a little bit of the story. Where is Saskatchewan? It's a mouthful, and, and I know uh, Canadian geography maybe not, might not be your strongest point, so I'll give you a sense of where it is, uh, who, who we're talking about, and, um, and a bit of who cares, why is this important. Uh, I'll talk about the causes of the conflict and the way things are changing right now, and uh, the way things are changing. Um, where do we go from here? I'll talk a little bit about the dialogue process that uh, I was working on over the summer and some of the challenges that associated with that and then um, some of the other recommendations that I've sort of identified in my research. So uh, I hope that we can have a, a discussion afterwards too. I'm, I'm, by no means do I profess to have all the answers, so I'm, I'm interested in, in ideas that you might have. Okay, so just I wanted to start with just highlighting some of the, the, the phrases that James and I sort of use in his talk that I think really fits well with what I want to talk about, you know, this distrust of government, this yearning for friendship, respect and sharing of resources, real partnerships, uh, a sense that this is a matter of concern for all Canadians, not just Indigenous people, and that, that there needs to be better understanding between Aboriginal peoples and broader society. Um, I couldn't agree more. So what is, what is the problem that we're dealing with? Um, basically, there's a lot of tension between uh, Indigenous peoples and, and non-Indigenous communities in my home province of Saskatchewan. Um, a lot of that is based on the high levels of poverty that exist there. Um, a lot of it is from the history of assimilation policy, which so casts a long shadow, of course, on, on the situation in Canada. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, there's a big difference between uh, Defining what the meanings of treaties that were signed in the 1800s in Canada, um, the government sort of was interpreting it very much as the text that was written down. Um, indigenous people in Canada First Nations will say that this is about the spirit and intent of the treaties and about the relationship that was being built and things, things like that. So there's a real difference of conflict over, over vision, over understanding of what those, con those treaties meant. Uh, there's jurisdictional chaos. I've heard the term chaos. It's, it's you know, there's a Canadians are ma mainly led or served by the provincial governments in service provision, but Aboriginal peoples are, are served by uh, the federal government. Uh, but there's a, it's a very complex web of interlinking sort of government structures, and they don't work very well together. And I think that's part of what leads to some of the poor development um, results. Uh, there's a lack of understanding and growing frustration on both sides. Uh, and then I think there's, there's little interaction and dialogue. There's not a lot of opportunities for the two, two different communities, or more than two, obviously, but, but for the communities to, to interact with each other. So just a little bit about where I'm coming from. So I, I've been working on peace building, as, as uh, Rosemary was saying, um, sort of looking at international conflicts. So I was working in Turkey, looked at their, their conflict with the Kurdish people. I worked on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, 
So I'm quite interested in sort of what does international development and international conflict, uh, what does that lens bring to a domestic situation like Canada? Um, and so, so uh, Galton, sort of the, the father of sort of modern peace theory, um, talks about negative and positive peace, and this idea that negative peace is is one where you have no, you don't have fighting, there's no bloodshed, uh, but you don't really have a a real peace based on a common understanding of where you want to go. And, and it, building peacemaking is sort of about going from that negative peace to a positive peace, where you have a, a peace built on based on sort of equality and justice. Um, you still have conflict. Uh, conflict management theory talks about you know conflict is not a bad thing. It's it's what makes change, uh, but it's about how you manage that properly in ways that, uh, that hopefully people don't get hurt. It's a difficult and messy process, but it's, it's a necessary process. What is reconciliation? Again, there's many definitions of that, and this is sort of a pretty, pretty loaded word. Um, in Canada, it's associated with the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has um, been set up going, I think, two or three years now to look at the residential school issue. Um, but I think it goes much beyond that, and that's why I like this International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance definition um, that talks about reconciliation being a process, and I think that's very important, a process through which a society moves from a divided past to a shared future. Uh, and it's about, again, this new relationship, and I think process and relationship are very important words that are built on respect and real understanding of each other's needs, fears, and aspirations. So that's my framework for looking at those two issues. Where is Saskatchewan? So um, here's Canada. Saskatchewan is the green one right in the middle, the easiest province to draw in Canada. Um, where, uh, so yeah, that's Saskatchewan for me. So this is where I grew up. Um, I went to university in Saskatoon there. Um, I lived there for the first 24 years of my life. I haven't lived there for 12 years. Um, but it's a small province, about a million people, um, some of the friendliest people you would probably ever meet. Um, but it's also been one, traditionally one of the country's poorest. It's a farming uh, region, um, so you know, the economy is based on how well the wheat crop or the canola crop has done that year. However, it's, it's changed a lot and that it's moving right now. Um, there's a lot of resources underneath the ground. There's uranium, there's oil, um, there is uh, potash, and so right now things are moving. And that has a, so there's a, it's an interesting, I was back this summer and there's a real sort of sky's the limit mentality right now. It, uh, it's quite positive, I think, in many ways. Uh, it's quite interesting, but it, it obviously has implications for indigenous issues um, in that, you know, a lot of people I talked to this summer were saying, um, First Nation youth are sort of looking at the province getting rich uh, and seeing, thinking, you know, these are my resources, these are our resources, we can give them up, but where, where's my benefit? And they're, they're not seeing it. So, um, who lives in Saskatchewan? So when we say Aboriginal people or Indigenous people in Canada, um, there's a fairly specific meaning in the Canadian Constitution. There's three different types of Aboriginal people defined. So Indians, Métis, and Inuit. Um, Indians, have, I mean, that's sort of the term that was being used in the Indian Act, uh, which is still in place, but this, uh, the term is preferred now is First Nations. Uh, Métis are a community that was um, sort of descendants of the European fur traders in the 18th century and First Nation women that sort of developed over time uh, a unique culture and language and collective identity. Um, and Inuit are an indigenous people who live in the north. Um, so 150,000 odd Aboriginals live in Saskatchewan in 2011, 15% of the population. Of those 150,000, 65% are First Nation, 33% are Métis and 1% are Inuit. It's so quite a diverse group. We've got five linguistic groups and 74 um, First Nations. Uh, who, is, who are the, the non-Indigenous population? Um, so, 70, in 2011, the census, 76 percent of the population is of European ancestry. Um, Fifty-five percent of people report a sort of a mixed heritage. Um, I like to sort of joke that we're most, mostly mutts um, in Saskatchewan and the mixtures. Uh, but of, of relatively European descent, German, English, Scottish, Irish, Ukrainian, um, and French. Just a 6.3% visible minorities, and I think that's actually probably doubled or tripled since when I was a kid. Um, so, that's, so that's changing. 
So when we're talking about the causes of the division between the communities, what are, what are some of them? Again, I mentioned the history. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that a lot of you know about some of that history, so I won't get into too, too much detail. And James and I have sort of touched on some of it. Um, but the residential schools is a big part of it. Basically, Canada, in order to open up the West to settlement, uh, signed treaties with, with, uh, with First Nation communities that were there um, in the 1870s. Uh, promising sort of a mutual relationship and a nation-to-nation -nation agreement um, that would sort of allow access to land for settlers in return for education, um, health services, things like that. Um, then, just a few years later, 1876, the government passed a legislation called the Indian Act, which was basically sort of attempted to sort of assimilate um, Aboriginal people into, into the Canadian society. Um, so and that Indian Act is still in place today. So that, uh, like again, last across the long shadow, chiefs under that act are subservient to the Minister of Indian Affairs. Uh, they don't really have a lot of policy, um, uh, a way to make their own policy. There's, again, they're subservient to the government. Some of the other causes, we have poor delivery of services. The, the Auditor General wrote a 2011 report, very hard hitting at the government, saying that. Um, Basically, services that are provided to First Nations on reserve are, are nowhere near the, the level that most Canadians enjoy. Again, it's partly because the federal government delivers services on reserve, whereas most of us are, are served by the provincial government. And you know, most, when you're in Ottawa and you're, you're far away, it's hard to be a little bit uh, maybe, uh, responsive to local needs. The Assembly of First Nations, which is the national institution of First Nations in Canada, uh, they argue that uh, there's about $9,000 per capita is spent on First Nation people um, by all the different levels of government, to where compared to about $15,000 for your average Canadian. Um, so, so again, poor, poor services, uh, poor Aboriginal governance accountability. This is a bit of a controversial claim, probably, but it's uh, a lot of this taxes are incredibly. Uh, it's a lightning rod for, for some of the conflict. Um, in the treaties that were signed and under the Indian Act, um, First Nations do not pay income tax if they're living on reserve. Um, and this has become a bit of a sort of a source of identity for many First Nations, and that they sort of, this is part of what makes them different from other Canadians. Um, it's also resented by, by a lot of other Canadians that see why, you know, why, why should they not pay taxes, and I do. Um, and many argue that because they're not collecting taxes from their local communities, that there's less accountability to, to their communities, which breeds less governance. Again, that's, that's a disputable fact, but that's, that's one of the arguments. The other argument side of it is that, um, that you have poor Canadian governance and, governance and accountability as well. Again, um, most of the funding for First Nations is done on a one-year agreement. It's, um, there's no sort of transport for formula for how much money they get each year. So it's hard to run a government when you don't know how much money you're getting, um, when you, uh, you're getting less and less money every year, your population is growing. So again, First Nations governments would argue it's, it's, it's not our fault that we don't have the money to do the job properly. Um, I've talked about the different interpretations of treaty, um, and some of the conflict of worldviews I think is, is also a part of this conflict. Um, Again, I think it's a sort of a continuation of the policy of assimilation. You hear often this, this sentiment that First Nations and Aboriginal people need to adapt to the, to the current situation, the current economy. Um, and many First Nations are, would agree with that and, and are uh, signing multi-million dollar deals with uranium companies or with oil companies. And, and so, um, whereas others are saying, no, that's not, that's not where we want. Um, so there's a... There's a, I don't think there's any consensus within Aboriginal communities about what type of uh, uh, future they want, and I don't sort of see a whole lot of room for dialogue at this point, so which is, which is a shame. Uh, why should we care? I guess it's sort of the... So there's, I think there's the moral argument, obviously, that the fact that um, what James and I were saying, under funding for housing, um, Aboriginal earn 30% lower than other Canadians on average, Life expectancy is six and a half years shorter for First Nations and Aboriginal people in Canada. Um, education, just 40% of those people living on reserve have a high school degree. Um, so there's, there's obviously, I mean, this is a human rights issue, this is a justice issue, this is, um, 
this is something that needs to be solved. Um, but I would argue that obviously the more argument isn't persuading everyone because we, we'd have it finished by now if it did. Um, so some of the economic argument, there was just a recent um, report that came out saying that the Saskatchewan economy is hurt by, uh, takes a hit of 3.8 billion per year um, because of poverty, which is about $4,000 per resident. Um, they're arguing that one third of that amount comes from costs to justice, to health, to social services, and that two thirds of that is due to lost tax revenue uh, and lower productivity. So that's, I think those are the types of arguments and those types of um, studies are, start, are interesting and you start to sort of bring different elements to the thing. Um, I would argue again as a peace builder, the conflict prevention argument that um, the population is growing, it's going to be 30% of, po of the provincial population in 20 years. Um, if you have your current divisions, racism continue, uh, you have a 30% of your population which is poor, um, which is young. Um, I, I, I see that as a recipe for, for race conflict, frankly, and uh, you know, so that's um, something we need to worry, worry about and to deal with. What are the current conditions for change? Um, so a lot is happening right now. It's, it's, uh, I find actually reading the news and there's something new every day. So yesterday, in fact, uh, the federal government announced a new, the passing of the First Nation Education Act that one of James and I was talking about and that's stressing that they should wait. Um, so they did wait a few months and but now they've passed it. Um, so they've announced $1.9 billion investments for education in First Nation communities. Uh, and they've, uh, they are arguing that they're giving a lot more autonomy to First Nations in terms of their own education. So again, things are, things are moving very quickly. The demographics are changing. Uh, the First Nation population increased 29% in the last 10 years, three and a half times the rate of the non-Indigenous population. Um, again, 33% of Saskatchewan's uh, population is going to be Indigenous by 2045. Um, and in 2026, which is just in 12 years, 36% uh, of the population aged 15 to 29, so your, your, your labor force, um, is going to be Indigenous. So there's, there's obviously huge implications for all that. Um, things I mentioned, the booming resource-based economy right now, the, the province is really changing in character because of all this money that's coming in. Um, I don't know more, I'm not sure if people have heard about that, but this was created uh, by four uh, indigenous, well, four women actually, um, not, not all of them indigenous, but four women from Saskatchewan. Uh, that there was a unilateral change to the Indian Act from the federal government and they started off as a a hashtag on Twitter that uh, became I don't know more that sort of took off and it became um, a major movement and it really a positive, unprecedented uh, development of civil society within Indigenous communities, uh, which is growing as a result of I don't know more. And, and also, I think, an interesting example of where Indigenous and non Indigenous communities are working together uh, for a common cause. So, um, I don't know more is. is they turned their sort of movement as a peaceful revolution to honor indigenous sovereignty and to protect the land and water. So they've really uh, become a, come together with environmentalists who are not happy with some of the resource development, um, some of the oil sands, and they're and they're fighting this together. So it's it's, it's an interesting, I think, a, a game changer in a little bit. Um, the legal winning streak. So 174. Uh, different um, legal cases have been brought before Canadian courts since the mid-80s, and can and average of one ninety percent of them. So according to Bill Gallagher, who's a, a legal um, uh, an expert who's, who's saying that this has basically created a, a legal precedent in the Constitution, that it says basically that um, if you want to do resource development on traditional indigenous lands, you have to consult with the, with the indigenous people that live there. Um, and saying that first, so under the Canadian system, the provinces current right now have jurisdiction for resources. Uh, but the Supreme Court is saying, well, no, you don't have full jurisdiction. You have actually, you share that jurisdiction with, with Indigenous people. Um, and so that's, a, again, a pretty big game changer, I think. And uh, I don't think the provinces have totally figured that out just yet. Um, the Saskatchewan government still continues to say that they're not willing to share resource revenues with, with First Nations. Um, but other ones have shared, have, have signed agreements, and things are starting to change. Uh, I won't necessarily talk about 
again, I mentioned the million dollar contract. So again, First Nations are signing huge amounts of deals. English River is a, is a First Nation in northern Saskatchewan. They signed $600 million agreement with Chemical, which is a uranium company, um, over 10 years. So that's, that's, it's a bit misleading in that it actually $600 million that they're just giving to the, the bank account of the First Nation, but it's $600 million that in, is in jobs, is in contracts, um, and economic benefits. So that's, um, so it's quite interesting, and it's, it's serious money um, for, for populations. I think the community is only about a thousand people. Um, so that, that has, it will change things. Uh, I mentioned the federal education funding. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we, I would say we don't actually hear that much about it, but, but it is a pretty um, important part of our, our dealing with our past in terms of the residential schools, and, and it, it listens to um, the, uh, the stories of the survivors of those schools. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, so there was a study that was done in March 2013 that talks about moving patent beyond us. It talks about um, governance, including establishing authentic partnerships, engaging in shared decision making, common purpose, common values. Uh, again, a lot of the things that James and I was talking about, and I think this is um, what, reading this is what sort of inspired some of the work that I did this summer uh, that, I'll, that I'll mention to you now. Um, so I did an internship over the summer with the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. This is an organization um, which is arm's length from government that was supposed to sort of facilitate the implementation of the treaties that were signed in the 1800s. Um, so they're an implementing, they facilitate between the federal government and the First Nation communities on what does treaty implementation mean. Um, they've developed education system or uh, curriculums on treaties. Um, and they facilitated uh, treaty table discussions. Um, so I think they're, and, and what we sort of worked on over the summer is something that I would argue is about capacity building. So just a bit of capacity building, and I think it's linked to reconciliation. So capacity building, according to Baser and Morgan, is, is about transitioning from one pattern of behavior to another. It's about creating collective energy, a commitment to pursue a common objective. Um, and it sort of argues that cap Capacity isn't built, but it emerges that there is capacity out there and that you need to sort of find a way to bring it out. Um, so I think that's pretty similar to sort of what we talk about by reconciliation, which is a process to move from a divided society to, to a, a shared future. Um, so what we did in the summer is um, we started to do a dialogue process where we tried to figure out who are the main players in um, the delivery of services for an economic development for um, well, for the whole province really, but for but for uh, indigenous people. So um, the, the theory of change was sort of that if we can bring together the right stakeholders, the governments, the the businesses um, that are that are working on these issues, and we can find champions with e each one of them, uh, we can create energy and a sense that um, we have a common future and a common goal, and that we can sort of make some change. So again, it's getting at this idea of what is treaty implementation. So you have these treaties that were signed in the 1870s. You have disagreement over what they mean. Um, but what is it, in a modern context, if, if 50 years from now the treaties are implemented perfectly, uh, what does it look like? Um, and as far as I can tell, there's, there was no real discussion about what that means. It was sort of a lot of political rhetoric, but not a lot of um, real concrete discussions. So, so we started again this, this idea that we could bring together provincial government, federal government, First Nation governments, businesses, non-Indigenous businesses, uh, Indigenous businesses, uh, civil society, have a, and bring them all together and have some, try to, try to create a safe space where we can have some discussions about, okay, what, 30, again, 30 years down the road, everything is perfect, what does it look like? Um, and instead of trying to look at what are some of the negatives that are happening, what are some of the positives that are happening? What are some of the, the strengths that we can build on instead of some of the, the gaps that we need to fill? Um, and again, it was sort of this, if we bring people together and try to create a sense of me that we're all in this together, instead of pointing fingers, that maybe we can sort of make some change. Uh, so again, this, this is the strategy was to find and engage the key stakeholders, the buffering. This is this idea that 
uh, try to keep it away from the politics, try to, try to engage with, with people that are sort of at senior management level bureaucrats, business people, um, civil society, but aren't necessarily speaking at a, at a political level and so that they can be, feel free to, to have real sort of candid discussions. Um, and create this vision, try to assess the system that you know, capacity, what are, what are different um, organizations' capacity to, do, to make change? Are they ready to change? Um, what are some of the entry points that can, can be worked on? And, and maybe, you know, OTC can sort of, the Office of the Trinity Commission can play this role of a long-term facilitator of sort of a group of champions that, to, that tries to make some change. Um, what are some of the challenges to this process? So I, I think trust is a huge one. Um, and you heard from James and I uh, this idea that there's a lot of mistrust of government intentions. Um, again, I was reading about this First Nation Education Act that just passed yesterday. Um, you know, again, it seems in the face of things to say the right things. It's a lot of money and it's giving uh, autonomy to First Nations for their education. But um, results were, I mean, responses were very mixed. And again, I think that comes from the mistrust that is there. And there's sort of not a belief that the government can really be out, out for the right things. Um, so any process, I think, needs to figure out how to get past that. Um, obviously not easy. Uh, power imbalances is a huge one as well. And so when you're bringing together idle milk war on one hand and the federal government on the other, there's a huge discrepancy in power um, and in sort of ability to make change. So how do you, as you facilitate a discussion, sort of work with that? Um, legitimacy, uh, you know, again, how do you make the process legitimate for um, the stakeholders? So in senior bureaucrat that comes um, needs to report back to whom, whoever he or she represents and then so you need to figure out a way to, to make it a legitimate process. Um, the Genetic Code of Aboriginal Affairs Department, this is something that um, again from the capacity development literature talks a little bit about can you change the fundamental essence of an organization. Um, so Aboriginal Affairs was Indian Affairs it was created basically to, to implement a, a policy of assimilation. Can it now be changed uh, to implement a process of, of working with First Nations on their, on their own, for, for their own benefit, a mutual benefit? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure you know, if, that, if that's possible or, or whether you need to scrap things and start afresh. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that's easy to do, just to scrap the original affairs department. Um, so I think the first option is to try to work with it, but with the, but that's a challenge I think we will have to deal with. And then the last of all is the capacity of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. Um, it's a relatively small organization it's, and it's been working mostly on education initiatives for the last sort of decade. Um, I think to undertake something like this, you really need to make sure that you're, you have the ability to make it successful and the capacity to, to carry through with it um, before you begin or else you shouldn't begin.